Hi, I'm uh, Sudeshna Roy. I am, uh, I've been invited to give the COVID-19 um, lecture number 12 um, at Massey University's Care Center. Um, and my topic is Immigrants, Border Restrictions and Racism, um, Authoritarian Impulses in the Guise of Coronavirus Response. Uh, I'm a professor at Stephen of Austin State University in Texas, and I'm really, really happy to be here with you to do this lecture. Um, coronavirus has affected almost every, every country in the world, and different governments have different responses towards it. And uh, one of the things that is key is that any kind of pandemic or outbreaks um, they have a ten tendency to create fear. And fear is a very key ingredient for, you know, racism, xenophobic uh, uh, attacks, other kinds of thoughts about foreigners, about people that uh, are different from us. And uh, coronavirus disease and responses towards it have exacerbated some of these, uh, these uh, responses. So we are seeing and uncovering many kinds of social and political fractures within communities, um, especially with racialized and discriminatory practices and responses to fear that obviously disproportionately affects marginalized groups. And throughout history, you know, infectious diseases have been associated with, you know, cases of othering. And following the spread of COVID-19, uh, especially from Wuhan, China, discrimination towards Chinese people has increased. Um, this includes individual acts of microaggression or violence to collective forms. Uh, for example, Chinese people being barred from establishments in different parts of the world. But rather than looking at a disease as an equalizer, given that the disease has the ability to infect anyone, uh, COVID-19 policy responses have disproportionately affected people of color and migrants and immigrants and people who are overrepresented in lower socioeconomic groups and have limited access to health care or work in very precarious jobs. This is especially so in resource poor settings um, that lack forms of you know, social protection uh, and in the realm of self-isolation as a response to coronavirus, um, there is um, less possibility that these particular socioeconomic groups can do self-isolation. So it, they are at a higher risk of contracting the disease and having fatal results from them. Furthermore, uh, migrants, particularly those without documents, they avoid hospitals for fear of identification and reporting and deportation, um, ultimately presenting late with potentially much more advanced form of the disease. Um, also, acts of discrimination occur within social, political, and historical contexts where political leaders misappropriate COVID-19 crisis to reinforce certain racial stereotypes discrimination, doubling down, for example, on border policies and conflating public health restrictions with anti-immigrant rhetoric. So today's talk, we are going to focus on five different areas of the world to see how political leaders are talking about um, their response to COVID-19 and what those mean for the short term and long term in terms of just the discourse about COVID, discourse about nationalism, how the, the immigrants, migrants narratives fit into these kinds of dominant discourses and so on and so forth. So starting with uh, the idea of how a pandemic is uh, connected to racism, I'm gonna start off with a quote from UN General, Secretary General um, Antonio Gutierrez. Um, the pandemic continues to unleash a tsunami of hate and xenophobia, scapegoating and scaremongering. And he talked about this on May 8th. Uh, we were in the third month of the pandemic at that moment. He was pointing to many examples, including migrants and refugees being vilified as a source of the virus. 
So some of the key questions we are going to answer in today's talk is how do narratives of immigrants and migrants mobilities function within dominant discourses of COVID-19 responses? Also, what key messages and discursive strategies can we identify in the COVID-19 responses from specifically right-wing leaders and political parties and, and as I said, these five areas um, of the world? Um, so I'm going to give a very short background on previous research um, uh, and very recent research on uh, immigrants and migrants as the other. And uh, with regard to the, that, that uh, Genova's article concentrated on how European borders and European identity in response to the escalation, acceleration, and diversification of migrant and refugee mobility. So the idea of identity um, accelerating and you know coagulating around idea of well these people are others so we need to band together to create this European identity so Genova writes we, we are currently witnessing a remarkable conjuncture between the escalation acceleration and diversification of migration um, on the one hand and the mutually constitutive crisis of European borders and European identity on the other so it came replete with reanimated reactionary populist nationalism and racialized nativism, um, also routinization of anti-terrorist securitization and pervasive and entrenched Islamophobia. In fact, you know, this study is uh, pretty emblematic of some, some of the findings from this uh, analysis uh, in this talk. Uh, so despite the persistence of racial denial and the widespread refusal to frankly confront questions of race across Europe, the co current constellation of crises presents precisely what can only be adequately comprehended as an unresolved racial crisis. So we are talking about the time when Europe was admitting many, many refugees from uh, the Syrian uh, crisis. Second, uh, Bardhan's talk about tension between cultural identity and place. So she specifically talks, talks, talks about a lack of comfortable fit between cultural identity and place. Um, she analyzed commentary on New York Times, The Guardian, and The Times of India uh, with regard to their um, analysis and commentary on the movie called Slumdog Millionaire. And that shows that there are several different types of identities that can be formed, diasporic identity, hybridity, nation state, transnationalism, all of those types of identities are clashing with the idea of what is the right place for them within the narrative of the analysis of the slumdog millionaire. And the third one that I'm going to talk about as, you know, migrants and immigrants as the other is um, Grosskogel and at et al's 2015 article where um, they talk about some bodies are racialized as superior, others are racialized as inferior. And the important point here is that those subjects that are classified as superior live in what Afro-Caribbean philosophers following Fanon's work call the zone of being. While subjects that live on the inferior side of the demarcating line of the colored bodies um, uh, live in the zone of non-being. So um, in the COVID-19 responses, we will see all of these three important points being talked about within the analysis of the political leaders' talks. And the other um, background that I wanted to specif specify is uh, about immigration, migration, and racism. Uh, which has, um, you know, Karma Chavez's work, um, although her work specifically targeted queer uh, movements between borders, she also talks about how whiteness moves and casually disregards its effects on other bodies. And so when we are trying to protect people, our people from, you know, harm from COVID-19, how easily we can dismiss our policies as affecting other colored bodies. Also, uh, specifically with regard to migrants 
uh, plight during the COVID-19 issues, we need to see Hoops's work, Joshua Hoops's work in 2017, where he talks about the discursive relationships and uh, new discursive relationships and particular manifestations of whiteness in US agricultural communities. And in that he talks about how increasingly small town, rural and agricultural communities have become sites of struggle over identity in the United States. Belongingness and citizenship are key factors. And for example, long-term residents of the US often perceive increased crime overcrowding and destruction of residential space and exploitation of public services and property value depreciation as a result of migrant workers coming to work in agricultural communities. But they often um, undermine the important value of migrant workers work in the American economy. So it's a question of perception and, and uh, the perceived uh, and that leads to racism. And the last one that I want to talk about is the present condition of, so in, in Mohammed uh, Mutman's work in 2013, um, this uh, Turkish scholar talks about following a very critical conceptual engagement with Appa Durai's framework, including his concepts of hybridity and negotiation. Um, the author argues that the present condition of intense, dynamic and multiple global interactions between people because of mobility does not necessarily and uniformly lead to a pluralistic world um, of hybrid cultures or negotiated identities beyond nationalism or essentialism. So nationalism and essentialism are steadily at work, forcing back against any kind of hybrid cultures or negotiated identities. So let's talk about COVID. So the moment people started realizing how deadly it is and how infectious it is. There were widespread uh, border restrictions around the world starting say from the beginning of March till right now. So some nations um, started even banning, you know, asylum, asylum seekers. So at the, at the present moment, at least three in four countries home to 91% of the global population have imposed partial or complete border closures. Um, moreover, roughly one in two human beings is living under lockdown as governments try to slow the spread of the virus. So, as I said, nations have also banned entry of asylum, as, asylum seekers. The U.S. has said it will turn away potential asylum seekers at its southern border with Mexico as part of a move to close ports of entry to non-essential traffic. Canada has said it won't hear asylum claims from those who enter by land from the US. Um, in Europe, many, many countries, um, asylum hearings and services have been put on indefinite hold. Greece has already suspended new applications for asylum during the recent Greece-Turkey border crisis. So the world's 272 million international migrants may have difficulty returning to their home, uh, home countries in the near future due to increasing travel restrictions and fear, fewer commercial airline flights. So about 37%, so that's like one third, um, are from countries that have implemented near complete border closure. So of the 272 million that are out there, 37% are from countries near complete border closure. So they have no way of returning. Another 54% of the world's migrants are from countries that have seen at least a partial border closure. So it makes it really difficult to travel. So let's talk about the COVID-19 cases in the US. So the five regions that I'm gonna talk about are US, are some are regions, some are, some are countries. The US, the Europe, three countries in Europe, Brazil and India. Um, so that makes it four. All right, so the case in the US, okay. So as of September 14, 2020, um, 6.7 million are affected by COVID-19. There are more than 198,000 deaths in the US alone. 2.5 million active cases at this moment and over 14,000 of those cases are serious or are in serious or critical condition. 
So Donald Trump's response has been widely criticized and heard all around the world. And he continuously downplays the pandemic, even as of you know last week. He undermines health experts, left, right, and center. He contradicts them. He does things differently from what his own health experts are asking him to do. Um, he touts conspiracy theories all the time. And he's, he even promotes false cures. For example, he widely touted hydrochloroquine as a good you know, response to COVID-19 um, malaria drug. And he has started using labels to, as the virus being a Chinese uh, virus. For example, this is an actual, um, um, what do you call it, enlargement of a photograph from uh, White House when he was reading his uh, coronavirus, from, at a coronavirus briefing. And this is his notes and he has cut out corona, the word and the word Chinese has been replaced, replaces corona. So downplaying the risk itself is like, he would say things like, we have it totally under control. It's one person coming in from China and we have it under control. It's going to be just fine. This is first week of March. Then uh, sidelining of experts, Trump compares the coronavirus to the common flu, a comparison which at that time had already been debunked by experts, including Dr. Anthony Fauci, who is the head of the infectious diseases um, section of the National Infectious Disease Institute. Um, so last year, 37,000 Americans died from the common flu. This is quote Donald Trump. So last year, 37,000 Americans died from the common flu. It averages between 27,000 and 70,000 per year. Nothing is shut down. Life and the economy go on. At this moment, there are 546 confirmed cases of coronavirus with 22 deaths. Think about it, end quote. So he has been undermining his own health experts saying that this is highly infectious, we need to be very careful about it. In terms of conspiracy theories, um, um, Donald Trump refers to the coronavirus as the Democrats' new hoax at a rally in South Carolina. So, quote, the Democrats are politicizing the coronavirus. One of my people came up to me and said, Mr. President, they tried to beat you on Russia, 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 that didn't work out too well. They couldn't do it. They tried the impeachment hoax that was on a perfect conversation. They tried anything. They tried it over and over. They have been doing it since you got in. And this is their new hoax, unquote. So he is touting conspiracy theories based on what his people are feeding him, as well as from himself. And then the false cure was that he incorrectly claimed that the Food and Drug Administration in the US, the FDA, approved the anti-malarial drug, hydro, hydroxychloroquine for treatment of COVID-19. So he says, quote, the nice part is it's been around for a long time. So we know that if things don't go as planned, it's not gonna kill anybody. When you go with a brand new drug, you don't know what, what that's that going to happen. It's shown very, very encouraging, encouraging early results, end quote. So he, is, he has come up with this false, with this um, cure based on false science. And then la uh, lastly, the labeling of this Chinese virus, uh, labeling of the virus as Chinese. So he says in a press conference where these, this photo shows that he revised the prepared remarks. So having said that, um, how is the Trump uh, government's response imp impacting immigrants and migrants? The Trump administration implemented and extended travel restrictions and imposed stringent border control measures related to the coronavirus pandemic. pandemic. He closed the US-Canada border with a joint deal with Canada and later the US-Mexico border. So the latest uh, state of restriction, state of restriction indicate that while the United States moved towards reopening, the federal government is not ready to ease measures put in place in March that largely sealed up the U.S. to stem uh, the spread of COVID-19. The strict rules have effect uh, have the effect of continuing to curb immig immigration to the U.S. So, for example, 
um, Trump banned uh, people seeking green card, which is the permanent residency card in the United States back in June. And he said that it was going to be for 60 days. Um, the ban covers people seeking green cards that provide permanent status, not temporary visitors. Um, he does not, on the other hand, cover agricultural laborers. He said that this ban, the green card ban, does not affect foreign agricultural laborers. Uh, he cited the need to protect American workers. His announcement did not spell out how the order would accomplish that goal. So in one way, he's saying, well, we are not going to issue any green cards, or even he has stopped the H-1B visa, which allows foreigners to come and work in the United States legally. And, but he does not spell out how it's going to, how he's going to make exceptions for temporary um, agricultural laborers. So, um, he said also that in future, um, foreign workers currently in industries that are not considered essential might even be affected. So, but, but there is no such policy as of yet. So in Trump's words, from, apart from the others, um, other quotations that I just read out about his uh, attitude towards the widely, you know, just disregarding everything that the scientists are saying, let's, let's look at these particular words. We want to protect our US workers. By pausing immigration, we will put Americans first in line for jobs as America reopens. But a short break from new immigration will protect the solvency of our healthcare system and provide relief to jobless Americans. I plan to sign an order to temporarily suspend immigration into the United States. Mexico is partly to blame for COVID-19 surges in the Southwest. So if you really think about it, many of these words have certain particular strategies that are being repeatedly used. One of them is protection of our people, which is you know, an aspect of othering as we have talked about from our literature. So even before Latin America's COVID-19 cases began to rise, the US and Mexico had jointly agreed in March to restrict non-essential land travel between the two countries. And US Customs and Border Protection said illegal border crossings were down compared to last year. And health experts said blaming Mexican immigrants for surges is totally misguided, especially when most of the individuals crossing the border are US citizens who live nearby. In a month, border authorities had turned back roughly 11,000 migrants. We are talking about in April and May with minimal processing, with, uh, which included for the first time under the US modern immigration system, asylum seekers and hundreds of unaccompanied children. Also a very controversial order from the CDC um, was cited by immigration officers to rapidly expel most migrants at the US Southern border. Um, next, a discursive strategy is saying that economic well-being of the citizens should come first, um, excluding permanent residents. Uh, so during a press conference uh, for COVID, he says, we will enact fair trade. We are working on seven major fair trade deals right now. And when I say fair, I say fair to our country, because our country was ripped off by every nation. Friend, foe, didn't matter. Every nation was ripping us off at a level that it's just unbelievable. So to be honest, this is quote unquote, Donald Trump's words, every nation was ripping us off. And he doesn't go into any details. So there is this aspect of vagueness that allows him to tout economic well-being of citizens, but actually in a way he is enacting policies that would exclude legal foreign workers from entering the country and working. And then of course, the fear of the unknown, the other, uh, where when he closed the US-Mexico border, he said, 
unauthorized entries threatened to create a perfect storm that would spread the infection to our border agents, migrants, and to the public at large. Left unchecked, this would cripple our immigration system, overwhelm our healthcare system, and severely damage our national security. So by invoking the security, um, we are talking about fear of the unknown. We are not going to let that happen, unquote. So um, again, there is a discursive strategy to put up this unknown aspect about any kind of immigrants or migrants that are coming into the country. The fourth strategy that he uses is racist immigration related comments as distractions from his own failures. So Trump has been openly frustrated um, with polls showing that the majority of Americans think he has done a very poor job in handling the coronavirus outbreak. And he has frequently turned to immigration or attacking the Democrats. And those were two main uh, campaign staples for him. When he feels a need to demonstrate um, an, a, a, an executive action, he says either the Democrats have, have wronged him or that you know immigration is wrong for this country. So quote, Biden wants to surrender our country to the virus. He wants to surrender our families to the violent left-wing mob. And he wants to surrender our jobs to China, our jobs and our economic well-being, unquote. This he said just a week ago uh, in one of his campaign rallies in South Carolina. So again, distraction from his own failures, you know, racist immigration-related comments and, you know, comments about the Democratic Party's intentions that he, where he, is he getting it from, right? So, but these are his discursive strategies. And lastly, you know, selective immigration for those willing to do low paying jobs because he says that, oh, you know, I'm going to allow people to come in with temporary visas. So he's basically using this situation, COVID-19 situation to institutionalize and sustain labor policies that are basically racist in a sense. Because by only um, welcoming people who can do the menial, low paying jobs, you're gonna sustain a community of people that can never really rise beyond their station. So Trump said that within the new ban, the green card ban and you know, immigration ban, farmers will not be affected, quote. If anything, we are going to make it easier, unquote. So officials recently touted bringing in Mexican and Central American agricultural laborers and extending the H-2A permission for seasonal workers, saying that would protect the nation's food supply chain and lessen impact from the coronavirus um, COVID-19 public health emergency. So ultimately, the pro the purpose of the executive order to stop immigration for 60 days is to help prevent the spread of coronavirus it defies logic to bar green card applicants, but still admit people applying for temporary visas, right? So such leniency towards temporary visas can be assigned to the fact that immigrants are highly represented in the very jobs that are sustaining the US economy now, especially frontline healthcare workers, as well as say grocery clerks, um, food and agriculture production, delivery services. So this practice can be actually traced back from the continued devaluation of domestic and agricultural vocation in the mid 20th century um, and the accompanying search for lower wage laborers of color that soon led to a very high concentration of Asian Americans and Latinx workers in domestic and agricultural occupations. And this remains the case today. So it is important to recognize that migrant essential workers were key to our economies and societies before the pandemic and we are likely to become even more and are likely to become even more essential in the recovery um, to sustain our weakened economies and exhausted societies so i'm just going to uh, very quickly explain how uh, the issue of class remains a very closely tied to the issue of immigration and migration to the United States. As you will see here, the people of color remain overrepresented in some of the lowest paying agricultural, domestic and service vocations. And this um, chart is from 2018. 
um, you will see that Black or African Americans um, in all occupations that are divided here make up 12.3%. Um, and Asian um, um, workers make up 6.3%. And uh, Hispanic or Latino population make up 17.3% in all occupations. Um, but if you see, these are all the lowest paying jobs, right? And Black or African American make up around 12% of our population. Um, Asians make up less than this um, of the population and Hispanics make up a little bit more than this population. But just the fact that so many of them are employed in the lowest paying jobs just shows you how disproportionately uh, lowest paying jobs are hiring people of um, these races and ethnicities. All right. So we are now moving to COVID-19 and Europe. And uh, in this instance, we are going to concentrate on three countries, uh, Hungary, Germany, and Italy. And all of them have different responses and their politicians' um, rhetoric would also be analyzed. So as of September 14, Europe as a whole, including Russia, has 3.8 million affected and 216,000 deaths um, in uh, that region. Most of them come from Russia. Um, a big pro proportion of, of them, sorry, not the deaths, but a big proportion of them are coming from Italy, Spain, UK, and Russia. And there are right now 1.4 million active cases. Now on the right, you will see that uh, Europe's coronavirus intervention, especially back in March, has been quite Drastic, you know, self-isolation, um, you know, mandated self-isolation, all of these countries who had put them in place by 17th of March. Social dist dis distancing was encouraged again by 17th of March. Uh, public events were banned in most countries by 15th of March. School closures were ordered by most countries by 15th of March. The, the, the people that were, that took late um, approaches were UK, which then bore a very heavy burden of the COVID-19 situation. And then lockdowns were ordered in most countries by the 23rd of March. Now, while we are going to talk about these three countries in Europe, we also want to talk about, because this is a key factor um, that spurs this particular lecture, right? Um, that how politicians and political parties are that are right-wing oriented are rising all over the world. So there is a rise of nationalism in Europe for the past few years. And Hungary is one of the top most countries uh, where the prime minister and the ruling party is actually right-wing oriented. You can see that Italy also has a big representation with 17.4%. Germany has a fair representation at 12.6%. Um, and I did Hungary, Italy, and Germany to show you, you know, a wide variety of people, what, what they're saying. All right. And in terms of the EU statistics for immigrants and migrants' jobs, you will see that um, the people who are... EU mobile, you know, they take up the good paying jobs um, and they take up less percentage of the poor paying jobs. The extra EU people who are migrants and immigrants take up less of the good paying jobs um, and more, much, much more of the poor paying jobs overall. So similar to what is happening in the US, but slightly to, the, to a lesser extent. So um, I'm going to start with Italy, where the Giuseppe Conte is their prime minister, and he was the first European leader to impose a complete lockdown because Italy saw so many cases. Um, uh, one quick thing about the previous slide, I wanted to point out that 13% of essential workers in the EU are immigrants. In some key occupations, however, the share is substantially higher. 
So for example, more than one in three domestic workers, more than one in four construction workers, and more than one in five workers in food processing are migrants. Okay, so in Italy, there were 288 as of this week, 288,000 cases and uh, 35,000, uh, more than 35,000 deaths. So Giuseppe Conti is actually a leader um, and he is from the independent party. He still supports strict policies towards illegal immigration. But the key point is his opposition leader, the leader of the league. Uh, he, Matteo Salvini is a very, very influential uh, figure in Europe's nationalist scene. Uh, and despite uh, the collapse of his ruling coalition with the anti-establishment five-star movement party in August, he continues to enjoy certain support, um, considerable support. Um, so the league's popularity uh, coincided with the aftermath of the financial crisis and the big influx of sub-Saharan uh, migrants from North Africa in 2016. And uh, as the Interior Minister, Mr. Salvini, spearheaded an anti-immigration policy that barred even humanitarian rescue ships from Italian courts. So for example, uh, right now, Salvini has given out some, some of these statements, quote, in Civita Vecchia, uh, 6,000 cruise passengers are stuck on board for two suspected cases. While in Taranto, the ports are wide open for 400 alleged refugees from who knows where. We must armor plate our borders. So he uses uh, metaphors of war. Uh, also, so unquote. Another quotation from Mr. Salvini. Uh, the government has underestimated the coronavirus, allowing the migrants to land from Africa, where the presence of the virus was confirmed, is totally irresponsible, unquote. So the way he incites and uses his words to totally undermine the govern government's position um, and point the virus's spread towards completely making the immigrants and migrants as the people who are carrying it into Italy is just frightening. Given the fact that Italy has such a large migrant population from Libya and their health and living condition is already disproportionately affected, um, it is really, really frightening how quickly um, Mr. Salvini can turn people against them. Okay. And one of the things that I wanted to point out is that uh, Italy's uh, response also brought about this emergence of Italianness in a good sense. Um, so it is notable that there is a sense of unifying Italianness that is emerging at a time when Italians are becoming widely critical of the European Union's cooperation or failure to cooperate with Italy. So while Germany and the Czech Republic have both prevented the transfer of vital supplies, and as borders within the Schengen zone closed, demonstrating the limits of these agreements within the EU zone, both China and Russia stepped up and um, they brought some supplies and they are building a genuine sense of goodwill among Italians. So you can imagine there is a lot of geopolitics going on over there. Then we have Germany. And in Germany, there have been a total of more than 263,000 people who have been affected and 9,400 deaths in all. In 2017, the far right alternative for Germany entered the federal parliament for the first time with 12.6% of the vote, becoming Germany's biggest opposition party. So, um, however, with the COVID-19 response, Chancellor Angela Merkel took a very no-nonsense approach. She closed borders. She uh, made sure that everybody was provided for. She made testing widely available and lockdown was in place. So what happened is that while, you know, this AFD, the Alternative for Germany party, um, has been pushing for strict anti-immigration policies and, and they have been em embracing hostility towards Islam and broken decades old anti-Nazi tab taboos. Um, 
it kind of lost its steam when Angela Merkel took these approaches and, and curbed the spread of the virus in Germany. So as you can see on the right hand side, um, at the beginning around May, this poll was taken about how um, Germany was um, handling and how the government was hand handling its borders. And 90% of the people agreed that it was really doing a good job. Um, but the far right were marginalized as they didn't have anything to say with, with all of this going on, right? Because they had their wishes. The borders were locked. There was nothing more to go on. Um, so they have spent recent weeks jumping from argument to argument. The party and its politicians have, among other things, criticized Merkel for not responding to the outbreak quick enough, said her measures were too harsh and authoritarian, so going back on their own uh, you know, agenda, and then go to, gotten into an intra-party fight over a proposed split between its more moderate and far, far right wing and blasted gender studies programs at German universities. So basically they're looking for something to pitch their uh, argument on. But when the Germany started reopening, they have come back with a new strategy against Muslims and immigrants leveraging unemployment. So this uh, bottom right hand picture actually shows a massive protest. It started off with like 50 people uh, but built on weeks of anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim, far-right rhetoric that says that that garnered 10,000 people in this particular protest. So even as Germany is celebrated as Europe's foremost example of pandemic response and eclectic protest movement that began last month, you know, in uh, August, with just a few dozen people here and there marching against coronavirus restrictions, ballooned the more than 10,000 uh, demonstrators in cities across the country. And AFD's co-chairman, which is the alternative for Germany, Alexander Gauland, has talked of fighting an invasion of foreigners. Um, and um, they see the protests as a first step towards moving back into the national conversation. Uh, because they were sidelined during all these months, using them to position their message for the months ahead um, when Germany has to face the job losses and battered economy, just like the rest of the world. So, quote from Alexander Gautland, when the depression hits and people really start feeling it, they will start asking, who do we share the little that is left with? Who belongs and who does not? I'm sorry, this was quote, um, Giotz Kubitzek. This is a far right publisher and the most prominent ideologue of Germans, Germany's so-called uh, new right, subscribed by the AFD. So that is the case of Germany. Now there's a resurgence of the national stocks. And then finally, Hungary. In Hungary, there are only 13,000 uh, COVID affected with only 6,000 deaths. So it has, it is done a really good job with keeping the, um, the spread to a minimum. Uh, Prime Minister Viktor Orban has cited the crisis to extract from a right-leaning legislature to begin with remarkably broad powers to suppress dissent and he has used the crisis to increase the extent of his political power by sidelining parliament and ruling by decree. So this happened back in March and he, he got this powers, these powers through the parliament. So under the emergency measure, these, these are the things that he, he's able to do. So he, municipalities have been stripped of valuable tax receipts. Some critics of the government have been detained and then released for Facebook posts critical of the government, while others have been issued large fines for protesting. Parliamentary parties have seen their state subsidies cut in half. The military has been dispatched to shore up businesses, businesses deemed to be of strategic importance. And rights advocates say that data privacy safeguards have been highly breached. So um, in one of the interviews, Orban says, um, quote, our experience is that primarily foreigners brought in the disease. 
and that is spreading among foreigners. Um, he was asked during a radio interview why Hungary had closed its universities but not schools in response to the virus outbreak at the beginning. Um, so this is quote, it's no coincidence that the virus first showed up among Iranians, unquote. He also says, quote, we cannot separate the tens of thousands of foreign students from the Hungarian students. That's why we thought it best to stop all visits to those institutions, unquote. And lastly, he says, quote, we are fighting a two front war. One front is called migration. Another one belongs to the coronavirus. There's a logical connection between the two as both spread with movement, unquote. So clearly he is um, anti-Islam. He is trying to pinpoint blame on Iranian students and he's blaming the immigrants and migrants for the spread of the virus. So what are we learning? So this is, this is in, um, this is police patrolling people in public areas during the lockdown. And this is Viktor Orban. All right, so what are the discur discursive strategies we are seeing in the, Europe's right-wing positions? One of the things is spreading misinformation. You know, it is very clear that migrants are, the, are not the ones who are spreading it. And it's spread from people to people because it is an infectious disease, not just because migrants are bringing it. And then us versus them, a national stroke, you know, in using the unemployment aspect, using resource protection aspect to amplify what we need and what we shouldn't share with them. Um, and then identity politics as to who should belong and who shouldn't belong to these uh, nations, states, um, as well as, you know, very high aspect of Islamophobia amongst um, this particular, you know, um, this particular uh, set of um, discourses that were analyzed and then metaphors of war being used. And these are actual uh, pictures taken outside Hungary where migrants are trying to enter and they are basically housing in, a, in small encampments and encampments that are very, very unhygienic and are in really big trouble at this point in time. Now we move to another part of the world where we look at Brazil's response to COVID-19, given that Jair Bolsonaro is also a highly right-wing politician. Um, so the, in Brazil, there are 4.3 million people affected and 100, more than 132,000 people have died in Brazil. And it's only climbing. We haven't even reached the peak. Um, President Jair Bolsonaro also tested positive for COVID-19. Yet his first response it was he has completely belittled its severity. Even last week, he is continuing to deny that it is severe. Um, publicly, he has defied social isolation measures by walking among crowds, shaking hands with people, encouraging others to do so. He has fought with and fired his own health minister who tried to err on the side of caution. And he has undermined the efforts of the rest of the country's leaders to stop the spread. Now in Brazil, it is a very unique situation with regard to not only the migrant immigrant situation, but also its internal racist um, policies. So the six richest men in Brazil hold the same amount of wealth as the poorest half of the population. And the crisis is disproportionate burden on poor black and brown people has challenged the country's popular deep-seated illusion that, you know, it is a raceless society and it's very equal. It's not true. Uh, so more than half of Brazil's cases are in its Southeastern region, okay? Um, with the epicenter in Sao Paulo, uh, where roughly 10 million people live in homes not connected to sewerage networks, and about 7 million have no access to running water. So this is actually a current picture of a Sao Paulo favela, which is a big slum dwelling. 
um, that are across many cities in Brazil. Blacks in Sao Paulo are 62% more likely to die from COVID-19 than whites. The only explanation for such um, a disproportionate amount of, um, of people who are likely to die being placed with blacks and browns is that Brazil has a conscious policy um, towards that that favors whites more than uh, blacks and browns. So Bolsonaro and his far right clique understand well that it will not be the country's capitalists, nor even the middle class who will suffer the most from the virus. So these sectors have the ability to shelter in place and to continue earning uh, without exposure. When infections do occur among the most affluent sector, they will be able to access quality treatment um, it will not be these layers, therefore, that shoulder the heaviest burden of the pandemic. Rather, it will be the poor and the precariously employed, the Afro-Brazilian community, the indigenous community, the elderly community, in short, the expendable sector of society. So um, as of the last year, 43% of Brazilians self-declared declared as white. 9% as black, 47% as mixed race. So the latter two groups earned less than 60% of the salaries of white Brazilians in the first quarter of 2020. So while white Brazilians isolate in apartment buildings, in middle-class neighborhoods, black Brazilians are making deliveries, they're working in pharmacies, uh, in supermarkets, they're driving buses, they're cleaning apartments, exposing themselves to more risk. So amid the COVID-19 crisis, um, crisis, observers point out that the government is condemning the incarcerated population to death. Brazil has the world's third largest prison population, um, about uh, around 800,000 people, prisoners and a system in which some facilities operate at 300% over capacity and pronounced gaps in the welfare of detainees predate the pandemic. So what do we learn from this? The first is that while the crisis is disproportionately affecting the health of the people who are blacks and mixed race, it is also disproportionately affecting um, the not the fatalities, right? So Lilia Schwartz, a Brazilian historian and Princeton University professor, explains that in the, the Bolsonaro's, um, Bolsonaro's re reluctance to push for isolation and his willingness to let the vulnerable die is emblematic of his larger, absolutely pro-death philosophy and practice of necropolitics a reference to the Cameroonian philosopher Achille Mbembe, um, who argues that states affirm their sovereignty by imposing pain and death on populations considered the other. So along with this devastating approach, the cri there is a crisis within a crisis for immigrant migrant women, women workers who are primarily from Peru, Colombia, Venezuela, Haiti, Bolivia and Argentina come to work uh, within the, the borders of Brazil. Um, more than 200,000 asylum seekers um, have been put on hold. And although Brazil does have a very progressive immigration policy compared to many other countries, at this present moment, many of these immigrant migrant populations are also at risk. So some of the words from Bolsonaro's um, rhetoric, um, you know, whatever his interviews. On March 27th, he said, I'm sorry, some people will die. They will die. That's life. You can't stop a car factory because of traffic deaths. So he is aligning COVID-19 deaths and some people's deaths with, you know, an in, in, in uh, like an object. Like it's, it's a fact of life, not that he is in a position to do something about it. He is leaving it up to nature. Bolsonaro continues to dismiss attempts to contain the pandemic as a hysteria, 
and calls for Brazilians to resist quarantine measures. So it's, it's not, it's a pigment of people's imagination. Asked by a journalist about the deepening coronavirus crisis, Bolsonaro replied, so what? What do you want me to do about it? He continued, we will mourn the lives lost, but it's the natural course of life. So again, Bolsonaro has this pro-death philosophy um, that is hoping that some of these others die out. Now I'm gonna show you this uh, very um, interesting comic that is going around, it's called Confinada, and it uh, basically means confinement. And it's a comic that is being recounted by an Afro-Brazilian person. Um, and this particular comic is criticizing the disproportionate toll the coronavirus has taken on poor and black Brazilians on top of the ongoing systematic inequality. So I'm just gonna explain what this says. In the first one it says, mom, Mom told me what happened, what a scare. Um, this is Fran, uh, a digital influencer, and she's saying that to her aunt over a video call. And her aunt is saying that her uncle and their family, um, family's maid, contracted the coronavirus 19 from guests. And they came over for a birthday celebration. The aunt is very categorical. It wasn't the guests who infected him. This is the uncle. He blames the maid uh, who came over for the birthday celebration. Um, the aunt is categorical. It wasn't the guests who infected him. She blames the maid. You know how it is in favela. Everybody is crammed in, she says. She brought COVID to us, but as you can see, it was the other guests who brought the COVID in the cartoon. Um, so the family spared no expense on medical care for the uncle who survived after 12 days in an intensive care unit. So this is an intensive care unit. You can see that they have not spared any expenses. He is lying face down as is very frequent with COVID-19 patients. And this, the maid dies in a rundown public hospital and is replaced by another one right away. New maid. Uh, I have to teach her everything. How annoying. Um, the aunt laments. And ha ha ha, I know how it is. But thank God the worst is over now, Fran says. And life carries on. So this is the state of affairs with Bolsonaro's approach to COVID-19. Everybody recognizes that it is, it is uh, affecting um, disproportionately the Black and mixed race population, but the authoritarian regime there is not allowing people um, policies that would enhance better health protection, or be better protection overall for everybody. And so some of the discursive strategies is that he's denying that Brazil has a history of racism. He's denying the virus itself. That's his, one of his strategies. He is defiantly doing some actions that is um, giving fodder to his followers that they can do all of that and still sustain themselves with, even if COVID-19 is there. And of course, you know, his discursive strategies through his words uh, definitely point towards necropolitics. And these are two pictures from their overly crowded um, prisons where a disproportionate number of prisoners are dying. Okay, now we, move towards focus uh, to India. And in India, which also has a right-wing leaning um, ruling party called Bharatiya Janata Party, and it's called BJP in short, uh, 4.9 million people affected, and more than 80,000 deaths so far, and this is not even close to its peak. Um, Indian government, um, the prime minister is Narendra Modi, has enforced a very strict lockdown for weeks. So there is this illusion of very responsible policy. But one of the biggest failure is that when they did the lockdown, India has a very large population of internal migrants who move from villages to cities looking for work. And he completely um, could not provide any medical or economic support for the poorest and the most vulnerable, especially this huge migrant population. Instead, he used this occasion to to blame state government saying, well, you know, we 
only have so much we can do, the state governments are the ones to be blamed. So the Indian government linked more than 1,000 cases to the, um, let me quickly say, um, the Indian government uh, linked more than 1,000 cases to this one instance, and I'll, I'll tell you what that instance is. Um, and the leading BJP party's leaders had many responses, um, you know, with words that, that really tells their original approach. Okay. So there is the Tablighi Jamaat, a Muslim missionary group that holds its annual meeting um, in a community center in Nizamuddin in Delhi. And they held that community meeting um, from March 8th to March 10th of this year. And it was days before India actually declared the health emergency and called for the national lockdown. But the government linked more than a thousand cases to this particular community meeting that happened at the um, mosque of the Tablighi Jamaat, right in Delhi. So right after they called the called coronavirus a health emergency, the hashtags that were going through uh, some of the BJP leaders' Twitter accounts were Corona Jihad, Bio Jihad, Corona bombs, and basically they started holding um, the Muslims as the primary movers, the primary people who were spreading the virus. Um, they turned a disproportionate amount of criticism to this one event and generated a cascade of vitriol. You know, people were killed, hospitals started segregating patients based on religion, uh, returning migrants who made these horrendous journeys were refused entry into villages. Um, so the BJP leaders tried to weaponize the threat to health to justify targeting Muslims. Um, as one leader within the party likened Tablighi members to human bombs, while another BJP member referred to the event as a Talibani crime, the, the fallout has obviously led to some discrimination, you know, because they're, these party leaders have large followers, um, Hindu majority followers. Um, so two newborn babies were died as a result of the fact that their mothers were denied admission to a hospital because they were Muslims. Um, so within India, an estimated 40 million internal migrant workers, largely in the informal economy, were severely impacted by the government's COVID-19 uh, lockdown. The transportation systems initially shut down. Many had no recourse, but they had to walk back, um, resulting in harrowing journeys. Those who were able to make it a home it, by miracle, uh, you know, they were either refused entry or they, they had to camp outside their villages. Daily wage workers were particularly vulnerable with limited or no access to social security or most were living under poverty lines. They were actually living hand to mouth. Loss of livelihood has led to a lack of money to pay rent, pay for food. Women are impacted even more so within this community because of their gender responsibilities as caregivers and members of disadvantaged castes and communities are also disproportionately impacted by this internal migration and, and the way the lockdown affected them. So if you can see that BJP, despite their, their you know, vitriolic rhetoric, scored really high for their COVID management. For example, 78% um, rates, 78% of population rates, Modi's COVID management as outstanding or good. 71% rates the government's handling of the economy as above average. But as you can see, massive number of people became unemployed over the course from March through May, um, closing in on 27% here, right? All right, so what do we learn? You know, Hindu nationalism has been on the rise and as you, uh, I don't know whether you're aware, but Jammu and Kashmir is one of the states in the northern parts of India. It was stripped, stripped of its stateship because it has been asking for 
self-ownership and um, self-sustainability for a long time. I was given a special sta status so that it couldn't possibly resist the central forces. Then uh, in December of last year, uh, the law was passed called Citizenship Amendment Act, and it basically fast-tracked citizenship for religious minorities, including Hindus, Sikhs, Buddhists, Jains, Parsis, and Christians from Afghanistan, Bangladesh, and Pakistan, those who um, were fleeing persecution in their own countries. But one religion was left out, and that was Muslim, or Islam. Um, and then last month, Narendra Modi inaugurated uh, the Ram Mandir, which is a Hindu temple that is built on the grounds of a mosque that was destroyed in the historic city of Ayodhya in 1992, um, amidst a lot of, lot of problems and chaos and riots in India. And that, the building of that, that temple has been on BJP's agenda since the 1990s. So you can see that this is the actual temple. And these are Kashmiri people who are looking to, you know, protest the restoration of Article 370 that would give them the statehood back. So one would ask or wonder why, you know, BJP still got those high marks for managing COVID. And I feel um, that the government's high approval may lie with how Modi has delivered BJP's, you know, campaign promise and vision of Hindu nationalism at the expense of India's Muslim minorities. So what are BJP's discursive strategies? Um, first and foremost, definitely Islamophobia. A lot is directed towards anti-Islam rhetoric. Um, whenever there is anti-Islam rhetoric, it is coming from BJP's other leaders and not really Narendra Modi. But the funny part is he is so verbose. His Twitter account is always lit, but he is silent and he does not condemn anti-Muslim rhetoric from his own party. And that says something, right? And then uh, strategies of deflection, they have this, um, all of these you know, things that they're doing um, to deflect from. So, oh, states are to blame, or you know, we have provided migrant workers with no, um, with food and, and some, some money, but there is really little evidence that it actually reached them on time and that it prevented the spread amongst them or their deaths. Uh, and then they have also done these other populist Hindu nationalist actions to distract from the real accountability. So all of these things that, you know, they're touting this Kashmir issue or they're touting this, um, the issue with regards to the CAA, the Citizenship Amendment, Amendment Act, and you know this uh, inauguration of the Hindu temple just last week. Th these are all things that distract from the real accountability for COVID-19. So we're coming to the end of this talk and we're talking about short-term consequences, long-term con consequences, and some of the things that I could leave you with, with with regard to how these discourses work together. So one of the things that is very important to notice is that populist politicians are painting asylum seekers and irregular migrants as threats to the containment of COVID-19. And the discourses of the politicians are creating a very narrow understanding of what and who they are to their own national audience, You know who, who the immigrants, migrants, asylum seekers are. So they are being painted as the other by playing up tension between cultural identity and their place in society, specifically for immigrants, migrants, and asylum seekers, as well as internal migrants are practically forgotten in the short term. Internal racism is systematically being overlooked in the guise of COVID-19 um, response. Uh, and with trust in multilateralism at an all time low, COVID-19 will also give new ammunition to the nationalists. So control the borders, you know, keep the virus and especially the people who carry it away from us. You know, we can expect even more of an us first of approach in politics, our vaccine, our PPE, our health, our borders, our people first. Um, so this can happen, continue to happen in the short term. 
As is ev evidenced through this analysis, some governments are taking advantage of the COVID crisis to push through legally dubious, you know, hardline migration policies that can't be justified by public health concerns alone, and that could stay in place long after COVID-19 outbreaks subside. And that is in particular a very troubling um, situation for immigration, migration, uh, immigrants, migrants, any type of asylum seekers. And just as social distancing and frequent hand washing aren't precautions available to all, the choice between staying put and crossing an international border is sometimes not available as a choice to people. It is sometimes a matter of life and death. While the journeys others are taking have become even more dangerous. So since COVID-19 began, it's rapid global spread at the beginning of March, Populist politicians in Europe and elsewhere have sought to paint asylum seekers and irregular migrants as threats. Um, but instead of being a threat, if you really think about it, irregular migrants, asylum seekers are among the most vulnerable because of stigma, because of discrimination and their precarious situations. So how can they be the problem? They are receiving the problem at a disproportionate amount compared to people who are already established and situated in those countries. So I just wanna give a few examples, for example, asylum seekers and migrants in Libya, where many are housed in overcrowded unhygienic detention centers, where the civil war is escalating despite fears of COVID-19. And these people are continuing to attempt to cross to Mediterranean in absolutely unseaworthy boats and once they are there, the European governments are stopping them from entering. They, 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 they have shuttered ports. They, you know, search and rescue operations are banned in some places. So it is not a choice whether they cross over or not. And in Asia, for example, dozens of Rohingya refugees from camps in Bangladesh reportedly starved to death at sea after the Malaysian government refused to take them in, citing virus-related border closures. What could be the short and long-term consequences? For example, what would happen to immigrants' future conditions and adaptation abilities with, you know, with these kinds of structural, cultural, and discursive conditions being placed by authoritarian regimes now? So structurally, you know, labor laws can be changed and people can be people who are in these conditions, immigrants, migrants can be per perennially within the lower range jobs. Uh, because, and, and, you know, the US has stopped the green card uh, application process, you know, even it's tried to stop foreign um, students from coming into the country at one point, thankfully, that was overturned by the courts. In terms of cultural um, conditions, um, in some ways, these nationalistic talks can incite a lot of hatred, a lot of more stereotypes, a lot of discrimination from um, the people, the citizens of that country, the hosts. Um, and in terms of discursive conditions, you know, this narrow uh, definition of who the immigrant is, who the migrant is, is definitely going to have long-term effects on these people's identities. So the gov government actions in terms of you know, what they do towards immigrants, migrants, you know, um, stability within their, their borders, media portrayals internationally as well as, as domestically will have long-term consequences on them. And then, you know, this will also have long-term consequences in terms of changing race relations. You know, people who are already vulnerable may become even more vulnerable in terms of race relations and then changing host cultural receptivity. So if you are going to view them as carriers of disease, as people who are gonna take away your jobs, uh, as it is in, in very, you know, in, in, the, in, a, in a situation where we are facing um, long-term recovery from, especially economic sector, these kinds of host cultural receptivity will also have implications for the long-term. So all of these factors are connected to one another and to immigrants and migrants ascribed identities as well as felt identities in so many different ways. So I will leave you with some final thoughts here. First and foremost, forecasting the post-pandemic world is very tempting 
and but it is also difficult from a communication standpoint. Um, the previous slide shows you all the things that can happen and what we can do. Um, and I'm, I'm coming to that. And basically the initial responses from the different governments, especially the right-wing ones, as well as the environment crisis that COVID-19 has brought about might, this is a hopeful me, might prove to be misleading, might prove to be temporary rather than reliable predictors. Um, because pandemics do place increased demand on scarce resources and enormous stress on social and economic systems that lead to miscommunication, lack of communication, and all of those things. Um, however, you know, proper health communication, proper communication for legal issues relies not only on well-functioning health system with universal coverage, but also on social inclusion, justice, and solidarity across um, people, across um, countries, across um, across governments. So, well, all I'm saying is we have certain spaces for discourses of res resistance to form um, that can push back against these authoritarian impulses. And it can be attempted by undertaking the culture-centered approach towards immigrant migrant narratives by showcasing their stories, by showcasing their troubles, because even within their stories, there is power. There is power to move people. There is power to um, change policies in the long run. And so there are pockets of um, and spaces where discourses of resistance can be attempted. And that's my talk. Thank you very much.